Hello, students. We're back again to talk about this topic we began yesterday on fossil fuels. Now, if you remember yesterday, we talked a lot about coal and we finished with the stages of coal formation. Make sure you're studying that list. Uh, definitely will be on your quiz. So going from peat to lignite to bituminous coal to anthracite coal, an important uh, progression of stages due to time, pressure, and heat. But let's continue today with the other types of fossil fuels. So let's continue with oil. Oil is the liquid fossil fuel, and it's also called petroleum. Petroleum, you may have heard of petroleum jelly. Petroleum jelly is not something you spread on bread and eat with peanut butter. No, no, no. No, petroleum jelly is, what is petroleum jelly also known as? Uh like Vaseline, uh, you, you put it on your lips. Maybe if you've got cracked lips, uh, it's it's a product. It, it's a it's something that's found in many products like chapstick and so forth. Petroleum jelly is made from oil. Yeah, from a fossil fuel. In fact, I've heard that in a survival situation, you could uh, you could if you have a a little stick of chapstick with you. You could put your shoelace in it or put a thread from your shirt in it and burn it as a candle because it's, uh, well, it's a fossil fuel, primary ingredients. All right, back to oil. Oil is the liquid fossil fuel, also called petroleum. You can see all these pictures here of, of drilling rigs out at sea or on land. You can see what the oil looks like pouring it into a container and we can also see where oil is found as well as what it's used in so a lot of interesting pictures on this particular slide but let's continue with how oil is formed oil is formed from plant and animal remains under pressure and heat Boy, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? It should, because that's how fossil fuels are formed, from the remains of plants and animals under pressure and heat. But let's check out this illustration here and the progression from A to C. Here on the left, we have like a water body, a sea, an ocean, whatever it may be. And over time, lots of things live in that water. And, well, have any of you ever had a fish, like a goldfish? Yeah. How many of you have ever had a goldfish or another fish in a tank and the fish died? It's sad. I know. It's usually the first pet that we experience a loss with. And now, how many of you have ever taken that fish and flushed it down the toilet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What an honorable way to be disposed of, right? Well, if that fishy had been in nature, eventually all of the, well, I'll be polite, all of the parts of that deceased fish would eventually settle down to the bottom, along with other bits and pieces of plants and other animals that die dead and decaying organic matter settle to the bottom. And again, if you've ever walked in a pond with bare feet, you're walking through the dead bodies of plants and animals squishing through your toes. What a lovely thought, I know. Now, given time, given time, those, uh, those dead and decaying layers of organic matter might have other layers of sediment uh, piled on top of them and could even form sedimentary rocks. Now, you start getting rocks on top of these trapped fossil layers, and you can be under a lot of pressure. And given enough time, given enough time, these dead and decaying plants and animal remains can be transformed into fossil fuels. 
And if the geology is just right here, you may actually get layers of different fossil fuels, including oil. And so oil can be found under the ground and it can be pumped from underground wells. Now, these wells can be in, uh, in areas on land, like in Texas or Pennsylvania. In fact, I think the very first oil well was right in Pennsylvania, next, next, our next door neighbor, uh, geographically speaking. But uh, these drilling rigs, in fact, when oil was, a little tidbit of info here about oil, when oil was first discovered, it was believed it was just uh, a useless material when they processed it. And one of the byproducts was gasoline. They just threw it away because uh, they didn't even know that the, their future, our present and past, uh, who would be relying on gasoline an awful lot with, uh, with cars and trucks. But anyway, these drilling rigs, just like a drilling rig in, uh, in our area where much of your water that you drink is from well water, drilling a hole down into the ground, if you go into certain deposits, you can pump out oil from the deposit. Now, I want you to look at this diagram here for a moment. It's overly simplified, I know, but there are these different strata or layers of rock, and the word impervious, think of the clay from our soil porosity activities in the past and how clay doesn't allow water to go through. That's called impervious. If you've got a layer of impervious rock on top of and beneath a fossil fuel deposit that has oil, and if the shape of the rocks is just right on top of that oil, you will more than likely have a deposit, or I should say an accumulation of bubbles that have bubbled up from the oil and have popped into this opening in the geology, creating a reservoir of gas. And we call that gas natural gas. Natural gas is the gaseous form of fossil fuel, the gaseous form of fossil fuel. And there are different forms of natural gas. If you live in a town, you might have a gas line of natural gas coming into your home so that you can have a beautiful blue flame like this on a stove and in your oven. If you live in a more remote area like, like our township, you might have a tank of LP like we have here in the lab. We have a big tank outside of LP, which, is, which stands for liquid propane. Propane is a natural gas that we burn when burning our Bunsen burners in the lab. But it is a gaseous fossil fuel. And uh, as I mentioned to a moment ago, natural gas is usually formed along with, I won't say beside oil deposits, but actually above oil deposits. So I think the other uh, illustration showed it really well. Uh, uh, if you've got a deposit of oil that is being drilled, typically right above that oil deposit is going to be a layer of natural gas. It is next slide shows it much better. The reason for that is because natural gas, being in the gaseous form, is less dense than the liquid oil. And so if you've got bubbles in a liquid, the bubbles will rise because they are less dense. So in this picture, which shows it pretty well, we've got a deposit of oil, and above that oil, is a layer of gas, and that gas can be mined or pumped out as well. Now, in your book, you can represent that maybe with this illustration here. 
So I'll, I'll talk about it real briefly as you're copying it down. But here we can have the ground level, fairly horizontal. Beneath the ground, as we learned in soil science, uh, we've got soil underneath that. And if you go down deep enough, you're going to get the solid rock, no matter what kind of rock that might be. Now, this doesn't happen everywhere. You know, the conditions have to be just right or had to be just right long, long ago. But in some areas, there can be these layers of oil and gas. And remember, the gas is always above the oil. For instance, if I were to show you a water bottle here, uh, I think you can see that on the screen. We've got the, the gas on the top and the liquid on the bottom. If I turn the bottle around, the bubbles go up. The bubbles go up to the top. That's where the gas is and the liquid is in the bottom. It's the same way with gas and oil. The oil is more dense, will go down, and the gas is less dense and will go up. So a, a more simplified version of this diagram would look something like this. Soil on the top, and, you know, if we were to take a cross section, soil, gas, oil, water, and rock bedrock at the very bottom. So this would be a very simplistic cross-section of, uh, of a geologic feature where there would be a deposit of oil and gas. Again, gas always on top of the oil. All right, so there we have it. We've talked about the three types of fossil fuels, the solid, liquid, and gas, the coal, oil, and natural gas. Three forms of fossil fuels that are used a lot around the world, have been used a lot for the last uh, almost 200 years, but a lot in the last 150 years to be sure, and uh, an awful lot in the last 100 years to 50 years. I mean, we've, we've burned a lot of fossil fuels since the Industrial Revolution. So let's look at how our use of fossil fuels has been. Uh, regarding our fossil fuel use, it is and continues to be the main source of energy. Uh, it's the main source of energy. And let me just do something here. Is this, is this, do I have something? Oh, no, okay. Let me put this back. I wasn't sure if I had something underneath that diagram or not. So it is the, the main source of energy in the United States. If we look at this diagram for a moment, uh, I'll try and point things out to you. In this whole piece of the pie, this darker area is the coal. That's how much coal we currently burn. And this is a few years ago. It's in 2015. The numbers haven't changed all that much, relatively speaking. But this part of the pie is coal. This part is natural gas, and this part is petroleum, oil. So between these three slices of the pie, that is well over three quarters, well over 75% of our uh, energy source comes from these three forms of fossil fuels, which is why it's really so important to be talking about this so that you understand the environmental impact, the energy impact, and the economic impact. There are many impacts to our fossil fuel usage. So most of our energy comes still from fossil fuels. Now this little piece of the pie over here is from nuclear power, from nuclear power plants. And uh, later on we'll be learning how New Jersey is actually home to the country's very first nuclear power plant down in Oyster Creek, New Jersey, down the shore. And it's still being used today. Uh, we have, uh, I think, three other nuclear power plants down in South Jersey. So we do get some of our energy from nuclear energy here. Then the little piece of the pie, this green piece of the pie, is about 10% currently. This is from renewable energy sources. More than three quarters of our energy comes from non-renewable energy sources. Only about 10% comes from 
renewable energy sources. And renewable energy sources include all of the following here. It includes hydroelectric, and we do have a hydroelectric plant right here in Warren County. It's called Yards Creek. Wood, right in our own township, a lot of people burn wood. Uh, you can grow new trees and in a human lifetime recoup a, that renewable resource. But we've got other things here too. We've got, uh, golly, I can't read what this one says. Uh, but I want you to look here. Wind, solar, geothermal are all in these top two layers. The, the yellow one here is wind. I know what the green one is. It's biomass. Biomass, like burning, like burning peat, uh, for instance, very small portion. But here's wind in the, uh, the yellow zone. Uh, solar and geothermal in these very top two layers. In other words, a very small amount of our energy usage comes from renewable sources. But I'm sure if you've been alive uh, and conscious and awake over the last few years, you have not only heard about, but you've seen the increased usage of some of these renewable energy sources like solar, for instance. I believe New Jersey ranks either number two or number three in the country today for solar usage. Uh, look around the neighborhoods and you'll see more and more houses and yards uh, putting up solar panels in order to generate electricity. And once those panels are up, the energy is free. It's, it, once it becomes daytime, it doesn't even have to be a sunny day. Electricity is being generated uh, every day. And so that is an example of a renewable resource. In fact, right down the street near the bowling alley, you may be familiar with the windmill there. That generates electricity every time the wind blows. But again, very small portions of renewable energy are used. So let's talk again about the fossil fuels. The main source of energy that fossil fuels are used in is industry, factories, um, the products that we use every day have to be made somewhere. And they are made in the industrial world where industries, factories burn fossil fuels to make stuff. So if you want to totally get rid of fossil fuels like that, then you better stop using stuff. And you can fill in the blanks with anything, anything made in a factory. They, they use fossil fuels to make our products. Uh, now, there, there is a growing population of people wanting to use more renewable energy sources, but you have to consider the reality of the matter of the, the infrastructure that exists. It's going to take a while to make the transition. Another major use of fossil fuels, transportation. Transportation, whether you're talking about airplanes, trucks, trains, ships, cars, uh, and the like, transportation is one of the major uses of fossil fuels. Now, there is a growing number of companies that are making electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles because we are, like it or not, we are in a transitional period in our culture where we're moving away from fossil fuels toward renewable sources of energy like electricity manufactured with renewable sources of energy. In fact, I would love uh, I would love for my next vehicle to be a solar powered car. Wouldn't that be cool? I think it would be cool. In fact, if you have time, Google the name Aptera. Aptera. I want that to be my next vehicle. It totally charges itself with solar panels. You never have to plug it in and you never have to fuel it. And you can just drive as long as the sun is shining. And even at night, it draws upon the batteries that were storing the energy that they gathered during the day. I think that would be absolutely phenomenal and cost effective. 
And if you Google Aptera, you'll see, I mean, it's a cool looking car. I think so anyway. All right, and then finally our homes. If you burn oil, if you burn coal, if you burn natural gas, as the vast majority of people do in our country, then you are burning fossil fuels, either directly or indirectly, to heat your own home, to heat your water. Because even if you have a completely electric house, unless you're off the grid, you're still probably burning some fossil fuels at the energy plant that you get your energy from in order to get your electricity. Although, as I said, we're in a transition right now and more and more people are being given the opportunity to choose more clean sources of energy, renewable sources of energy, as opposed to burning fossil fuels. So again, fossil fuel use is greater than 75% of the energy that we use that is a big number, folks, when you think about how much energy we use in our society in particular. But uh, your generation, your generation will be the generation, I think, to reduce our dependency on fossil fuels and make our own energy ourselves right here in our own country. And we don't even have to worry about importing fossil fuels from anywhere else in the world. To be energy independent, how cool would that be? All right, a couple more things here about petrochemicals. As I mentioned to you before, about stuff. The stuff that we use is manufactured somewhere, and it's also manufactured from something. And that something, in many cases, is from petrochemicals. Uh, whether you're talking about adhesives, various types of glues, carpeting, cosmetics, fertilizers, plastics, fabrics, rubber, paints. There are so many products that we use in our daily lives that are made from petrochemicals. Petrochemicals, a fancy word for chemicals or materials that we get from fossil fuels. So not only do we burn fossil fuels for energy, we also use fossil fuels to make stuff. And these products, again, include not only fuels, but plastics and fabrics, etc. And just look around the room and think about how many things in here are made of plastic. And you'll get an idea of, golly, how dependent we've become in our society on the petrochemical industry. I mean, look at all these pictures here of the various products. Gosh, I'm using, you know, water bottles uh, made of plastic from the petrochemical industry. Although more and more of you are using uh, metal water cylinders uh, to uh, perhaps save the turtles. Okay. All right. Moving right along. There's one more topic I want to mention for today. And then the rest we'll save for our lab activity tomorrow. That is what has become a very controversial uh, issue, especially locally. And when I say locally, I should really should say regionally in our neighboring state of Pennsylvania in particular. This is a big issue. It's called fracking. Fracking is a process of removing natural gas from the cracks in rocks deep beneath the surface. You may remember when we learned about porosity in our last topic with soil. Remember, pores are the empty spaces between soil particles. There's lots of empty spaces. We learned earlier how natural gas is less dense than the oil, and the gas tends to seep word in geologic formations into all of the cracks and crevices of the rocks. Fracking is a process that basically, essentially what happens is it's like a gigantic vacuum cleaner uh, that, has, uh, that is connected to a well into a rock formation and the vacuum cleaner sucks up all of the natural gas. Now, in and of itself, that sounds like a wonderful idea. And scientifically, it's not a bad idea. But the controversy is 
that in order to agitate and extract as much of the gas as possible, sometimes they drill another well and they inject it with chemicals to squeeze the gases over to the other well. They also sometimes will agitate the ground, like shake the ground, like you were shaking a bottle, which is almost like producing little mini earthquakes in order to get all the bubbles up and out of the extraction well. So there is some controversy over it and uh, for those various reasons. But here's a typical cross section of a geologic formation where there may be a freshwater aquifer that homes are depending upon. And we drill these extraction wells into a formation where there's some natural gas and, you know, all of that other stuff that I mentioned. So where are these places? Around the, uh, around the country, all of these colored zones are areas where fracking is a viable alternative to uh, extracting natural gas, which, by the way, does burn cleaner than oil, and that certainly burns cleaner than coal. So you have to weigh the pros and the cons here when thinking about things. But right here is New Jersey, where we live. And the northwestern part of New Jersey has some impact to it. Uh, we don't experience too much controversy here in Jersey, but in Pennsylvania, this Marcellus uh, uh, deposit here in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is a hotbed of controversy right now in terms of fracking. In fact, here's a uh, close-up view of this particular formation. These red zones in Pennsylvania, super-duper hot spots of controversy because there are large deposits of natural gas in these areas that can be more effectively or efficiently extracted uh, using fracking. But again, some controversy over the practice of, fraction, of, of, of fracking fracking. All right, so there it is in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen. There's our topic on fossil fuels. Tomorrow, we're going to be doing some activities to further illustrate the extraction of fossil fuels. So until tomorrow, I'm going to say bye-bye. <laughs>